So, let's do a quick recap, especially for people who were not here in the previous class. Um, and also, also for me to wrap my head around, hopefully, this stuff slides better. Uh, by the way, this is a, a shadow home assignment on political power, which I'm not sure I want to assign. You know, I'll, have to, I'll have to think about that. Because we have lost uh, a day, we have lost you know, one class and one seminar, and I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I want you to do two extra, you know, one extra assignment, like do two assignments for one day. That sounds a little bit inhumane. So maybe I will drop one of the assignments until the end of the year. So I'll, I'll have to think about that, okay? That's, that's neither here nor there. So anyway, so um, what we're talking about is uh, um, basically, again, we are finishing off the course. And in some sense, in some sense this is the last uh, uh, substantive lecture. This is the last step um, on our journey from protons to presidents and from electrons to elections. Today we get to the presidents proper. So and we are talking at the same time about, so we're talking about politics, and we are talking at the same time about international politics and national politics. And uh, um, because these things are related in important ways. And uh, there's a million different uh, readings I could have assigned, a million different perspectives I could have chosen. I have chosen the Marxist perspective. Uh, I have to signal, that's a, that's a tendentious choice. And um, the, 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 short, the short answer, the, the, the short reason why I chose it is because um, we don't have a lot of time, and we have to choose only one. And Marxism seems to offer the most value for time invested, and espe especially since it contrasts with the kind of uh, um, consensus-style consensus arguments which you are given in your uh, standard economics courses. So again, so this conflict, consensus, I keep talking about this, but these are, if you want, two ideal types or two ide ideal typical approaches of looking at the social world, both about the national politics and international politics. Uh, co consensus side emphasizes that uh, you know, global community, people working together to achieve collective goals, uh, globally but also within society, conflictual approach emphasizes conflictual elements, ideology, domination, that kind of thing. And since you are mostly getting the consensus approach in your economics courses, I wanted to offer the, uh, the, the um, you know, alternative, which is conflict approach. But, but again, preliminarily, preliminarily, uh, the, uh, probably a very good first step is if you're thinking, if you're trying to think about these issues, is to recognize that probably the world is a combination of both at the same time to some extent. I, at least, at least, uh, that sounds like a reasonable starting point. Anyway, so what I talked about. Mm, in the first lecture was um, basically this uh, so-called world systems theory by Emmanuel Wallerstein, um, who died very recently, who died this year. Uh, last, last time I taught this lecture, he was still alive. And um, Wallerstein talks about the countries of the core, of the semi-periphery, and of the periphery. So, and and all, all of this, all of this is derived from the character of the um, uh, Industrial Revolution. So in the Industrial Revolution, you have the emergence of a small number of uh, um, highly advanced countries who concentrate uh, labor-intensive uh, products or, product or industries. So this is, la uh, sorry, not, not labor, capital, capital intensive. So capital intensive. And because they are capital intensive, they have high degree of market power, so high degree of market power. But market power, and, and people stand for market power, but also for military power. And it's true, both. So high degree of market power and high degree of military power. And probably, probably I don't have to argue for this interesting connection between economic power and military power. Again, ever, you know, since the, at least since the invention of the machine gun, Wars are mostly determined by economic capacity. The outcome of wars, is mo as a matter of historical fact, as a matter of historical consensus, right? Wars are determined mostly by economic capacity. So the countries of the periphery are labor intensive. They're labor intensive, and that's why uh, oh, these these ten these these industries, capital intensive industries, tend to be monopolized. And this is partly what gives them their market power. And these labor-intensive industries tend to be very highly competitive. 
And I gave the example of, again, in the 19th century, Britain selling railway engines, and India, let's say, selling corn or, or grain in general. Grain is a very competitive industry. Britain can buy grain from uh, South Africa, from South America, from India, from China, for, from Russia, from ev anywhere. Whereas the railway engines, the really good railway engines are only produced in Britain. I say really good, but actually no. In the 19th century, the railway engines are only produced in Britain. And then maybe also in Germany, but the German producers and the English producers may be in collusion, or at least uh, competition is limited. And, and the, the, these are low in power. France. Yeah, yeah. Or, or, or France. It doesn't really matter. Because, well, again, this is fortunately not a class in history, but a class in theory. So I don't have to worry about these things. Um, but these, th this, is, this, is, this, is, this is the model. Um, and the second one is what? Semi-periphery. Semi and semi-periphery is this interesting analytical device. It says that countries of semi-periphery act as, as, as core towards periphery and act as uh, uh, periphery towards the core. Again, you see, this is a theory class, and I, I specialize in theory. And I spent most of my time reading through theoretical arguments, so I'm not really strong on the empirical side of the issue. I don't, I don't really think that the, that the defect on my side is just that, you know, specialization. But you, 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 you can fill in the gaps. Some people told me during the break that India also produces high tech, so I would imagine India exports its high tech to the countries of the periphery, but then with, with respect to the countries of the, of the core, uh, like the United States or maybe France or Germany today, acts as a, um, um, as, a, uh, as a country of the periphery, something like that. So why is this important? For, so this is, inter, so this is, this is we're talking about inequality and domination in the international sphere. Again, I, I have to keep reminding you and myself that again, um, value judgments, we need to try to separate them as much as possible from descriptive judgments. Again, my position tentatively is a, as, a, as of a conservative barbarian Marxist. So yes, there's domination. Doesn't mean it's bad. Not sure, but again, at least honestly, at the first pass, we need to recognize that this is a, this is a situation of domination. This is a situation of power. And this is why the kind of economics you study here in this university is radically inadequate because it fails to recognize this uh, um, important dimension in all of this system, which is impossible to miss if you just look outside the window. Um, now, so, so again, so immediately, how does this apply to uh, political situation? This is, this, is, this is international politics. This is domination and inequality in international politics. Wh what are the effects of this on the national politics? Well, the effects are the same, uh, well, or, or broadly speaking, similar, in the sense of um, the effects of inequality and domination in the international sphere provide the kind of unequal and also uh, 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 domination-laden internal politics as well. Mm. So we are talking about the bourgeoisie of the core, or maybe I should write core, and we have bourgeoisie, uh, actually no, I prefer that there. Core, bourgeoisie, core, proletariat, Periphery, bourgeoisie, periphery, proletariat. And um, again, Wallerstein, unique, I think, is uniquely situated to explain why here we have something like authoritarianism, authoritarian measures, uh, 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 domination through force and violence, um, whereas here you have something resembling democracy. Again, technically speaking, from Marxist perspective, it's better to call it <coughs> capitalist parliamentarism. So let's, let's write capitalist parliamentarism. Capitalist Parliamentary, because we're not we're not really talking about real democracy. These people do not have any political say. Now, do you ever want to talk about one dollar and two dollars? Not sure. Maybe at some stage. Anyway, so uh, uh, um, um, th and, and this this system provides a certain interesting wrinkle to the three problematic issues in Marxist analysis, especially in Marxist analysis in the Communist Manifesto. So one is the theory. One was the theory of class struggle. The, the second one was the theory of uh, state, and um, the third one was the theory of transition. Again, to very briefly recap, so for Marx, there are only two classes, and the, uh, uh, again, rich get richer, poor get poorer, there's polarization, polarization forces, again, again, so we're, we're talking about base superstructure model, base superstructure model, certain uh, um, conditions in the base, namely growing inequality 
force at, at the, uh, at the, on, on the pain of starvation, force the proletariat to unionize. Again, so base superstructure, base superstructure, economic changes, force ideological changes. But again, uh, um, the proletariat is driven to realize itself as a class. The class in itself becomes class for itself. So workers are, realize what their interests are and unite together because they are forced to by the, by the objective conditions in the market because of this growing inequality. This is, this is the standard Marxist picture in the class struggle. And there's increasing polarization. Of course, there may be some middle class, but again, these are ideal types. Don't have to care, worry about the middle class because it's very few, very few, very uh, small number. But the trouble is, if you look at Wallerstein's picture, this does not happen because you have these four categories, and the uh, uh, proletariat in the, in the core gets, as in the words of Lenin, bourgeoisified. They get crumbs, crumbs from the table. Maybe, maybe I should actually write the word crumbs on the board because it's kind of important. So here you have crumbs because we, we aren't actually looking at. Uh, um, uh, Real political participation, real political power. This is not democracy at work. People are getting crumbs. People are getting again. The, the, well, actually, I, should, I don't. Let's not write the word crumbs. Okay, the technical term is concessions. Concessions. <coughs> concessions. And here, basically, we have a violence. This is this is, this is the big difference. Uh, uh, partly, partly, to some extent, because you want uh, protest in the countries of the core to be educated and like high in uh, um, human development, right? Like highly developed in terms of uh, skills, high skill, if you want. And and these these guys are low skill, so you don't you don't have to educate them. And, and so high skill guys is kind of hard. Uh, at least sociologically, it seems hard to have a high skill population if you try to repress them down through violent violent means. But also Marx Marx is onto this. Marx understands understands at least some of this picture. Because Marx would say that to the extent that the bourgeoisie educates the proletariat, they are digging their own grave. Because the proletariat who is educated is capable of knowing their interests better, of organizing to protect their interests, that kind of thing. So, uh, so it is important also, it is part of the strategy of the countries of the periphery to keep the proletariat not educated so that they cannot uh, unite and, and, and fight against uh, oppression, if you want. Um, so, um, yeah, so, so Marx's theory of class struggle seemed to imply that communism, communist revolution happens automatically. If you look at this picture, no, no, it does not happen automatically. And as early as Lenin, Marxists have realized this, and Lenin writes about this necessity of avant-garde party. But you notice, notice, avant-garde party is not based, uh, 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 providing something in the superstructure. No, it's something in the superstructure. People, uh, some kind of educated sections of the bourgeoisie breaking off and uh, trying to organize uh, uh, the international workers' movement, there's absolutely no reason to believe that this, that this would su succeed. In fact, there's a million problems with this, because these people have to, against their economic interests, have to you know, work against the grain of history to try to you know, bring about this better future. It's not clear if this is actually going to work. I mean, I, I, should, I, should, I should write you know, Habermas somewhere, because, because this, this, is, this is what Habermas's project is about. You know, uh, it's, it's, it's fun. It's fun to talk about everything at the same time. But, you know, I was actually planning, if we had time to say, to say at least a couple words about Habermas. So it's like, it's not, I don't, I don't think that it's uh, uh, like completely out of the question. I think uh, there are theorists today, again, the, the foremost among them is Jürgen Habermas, who thinks that in some fashion, although Habermas has gone a very long way from being a classical Marxist, and, and his picture is more sophisticated than this, but I think at bottom, at bottom, this is what Habermas is talking about. It, it's not really avant-garde party anymore. But you know, some like some like, a, like a, 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 a critical mass of intellectuals in the world. You know, we'll talk about this more. Actually, I should talk about Gramsci before I talk about Habermas. But I think this project is still alive. Well, actually, you know, since I, since I mentioned Gramsci, let's let me write Gramsci on the board as well. Uh, um, but but again, so Marx in the Communist Manifesto imagines that this transition would be automatic. That again, struggle leads to more struggle. Rich get richer, poor get poor. But not true. Uh, again, concessions, 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 or or, or violence here, and again, the, it's, it is in the interest of the elites uh, of the periphery to um, to keep the system working, not to not to not to challenge the system. Um, so, class class struggle automatically used to lead to uh, um, communist revolution. It doesn't anymore in this picture. So, actually, I'm talking about number one, but I'm actually talking about number three. The transition used to be automatic, but not anymore. But not anymore. 
And when, when I talk about class struggle, it used to be that we were only talking about two classes, now we're talking about at least four. Again, these are ideal types, you can imagine that there are more than four classes. But for the purposes of the system, the, 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 the basic tendencies in the model are captured well enough by just these four classes. Again, the more complexity you introduce into the system, the less clear all this becomes. And we don't need, we don't, we don't need to. Uh, um, uh, the theory of the state, I need to talk about this at some point, but again, the idea is uh, that the state plays a crucial role in all of this, because again, in, in classical uh, uh, Marxist analysis, especially in the volume one of Das Kapital, the idea was that uh, the state is ju just simply acts as a committee for managing the common affairs of the bourgeoisie, and uh, basically uh, uh, the state is powerless in the first volume of Das Kapital, to prevent the bourgeoisie from destroying itself, capitalism from destroying itself through the crisis of overproduction. I keep mentioning this phrase. Let me write this somewhere. Crisis of overproduction. I mean, this whole system, in some sense, is the solution to the crisis of overproduction. So let me write, crisis of overproduction. This is the solution to the crisis of overproduction. You can keep shifting uh, uh, cri local crisis of overproduction everywhere such that you don't get one global crisis of overproduction that stalls everything. And again, in 2008, that's exactly what happened. You had a crisis of oil production in the United States of America. Who saved us? China. China has, you know, what is this beautiful, beautiful, so like, how they built uh, like 30%, like Chinese economy, government spending absorbed like 30% unemployment, and they have built more roads, more buildings than like the rest of the world combined in 100 years or something like that. So, uh, I mean, there is some. Like econometric, if you want, there's some you know uh, economic basis from the standpoint of empirical economics uh, uh, to what I'm saying, but I don't want to talk about that because this is a course in theory, and I don't have to worry about uh, the messy details of the world too much. Uh, mm. So, what are we left with? What are we left with? Well, let me talk about Gramsci, I suppose, for five minutes. I should talk about three phases, phases of power, but let me talk about Gramsci first because it's more fun, and then we'll see if we get to three phases of power. So there's this, again, a bunch of names. You need to remember these names. Well, Habermas is a very important name, and Wallerstein is a very important name. And Antonio Gramsci definitely is a very important name. Antonio Gramsci is probably the most important Marxist after Marx. There is some competition. Competition is tough, but, you know, Gramsci is a good, is a good, good bet, solid, solid bet. So um, Gramsci basically uh, is asking this question. Why has the revolution not happened? Uh, in the advanced countries of Europe. And he's come, he comes from Italy, so specifically in Italy. And um, Gramsci, actually, he's writing before Wallerstein, okay? But, you know, this whole picture fits together. And Lenin and Wallerstein and John Hobson, to some extent, are, are talking about the same picture. So I can talk about them at the same time. It doesn't matter too much. So what uh, uh, Gramsci is up to, by the way, is so much more comfortable to talk in this room. I don't know why. It's a new place, shift, shifting places. It's dust to my subconscious, sort of thing. Anyway, let me go back to Gramsci. Uh, um, so Gramsci is asking this question, which is going to, and, and his analysis is going to fit very well into what we have been talking about with uh, a Wallerstein. Um, and um, Gramsci says that there are two countries. There are countries in which civil society is highly developed and civil society is un underdeveloped. Or, you know, let me, let us, let's just talk about uh, developed countries and underdeveloped countries. Undeveloped countries. So, so, I don't know, developed, well, actually, no, this one. Well, actually, we, we, I, could, I could just write periphery and core, if you want. But Gramsci does not use these terms, okay? He's, going, he's well, again, I think that the technical term that Gramsci uses is uh, 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 countries with advanced civil society and countries which lack advanced civil society, civil society. Mm, so maybe I should write that too. So no civil society, a developed civil society. Civil society is an interesting word, you know. You roughly understand what I'm talking about. I could talk in detail what is the technical definition, but I don't want to, you know, this will lead us astray. So basically he says that um, uh, anticipating what Wallerstein is going to say. And they're both Marxists, so they agree. What happens is countries in which there is no civil society, for example, in Russia, uh, the government keeps, uh, keeps itself in power through violence. And so Gramsci says that in order to have a revolution, you need to first have what he calls the war of movement, and then, so war of, war of movement. 
uh, which is basically you need to have a violent revolution, violent revolution that grabs, that snatches the power away from the government. And then, then you have to engage in the war of position, war of position. So, I mean, these are the terms he takes from uh, military strategy. Is this really important for understanding Gramsci to explain the analogy? Okay, let me try it in one sentence. So, war of movements like Napoleon maneuvers, swift movement, or blitzkrieg. So, this would be war of movement. War of position, this would be, you know, like slow trench warfare of First World Wars. Ah, as uh, um, Weber says, ein langsames Bohren uh, von harten Brettern. The slow boring of hard boards. And in terms of the core, the, the, the um, order is reversed. You need to start with the war of position, and then you go to war of movement. So this is, this is recipes, recipes. Now, uh, more specifically, what are we talking about? We are talking, okay, and again, Gramsci has this very important word, hegemony, hegemony, and uh, technically speaking, is hegemony the same thing as ideology? Well, yes and no, it's similar, it's similar. So hegemony uh, basically involves two, two, two things. One is ideology, and the other one, concessions. Is that word concession? Breadcrumbs. So, uh, uh, so the bourgeoisie shares a little bit with the proletariat, because again, remember, very famously, Marx says in the Communist Manifesto, workers have nothing to lose but their chains. Well, you've got to give them something to lose. Not much, not much, but something to lose. So that they are afraid to riot, because, because they're afraid to lose what little they have. Uh, uh, and more specifically, when he talks about ideology, is when the bourgeoisie, or the ruling class, presents its interests as the interests of all interests of all. And basically, in, the, uh, in these countries of, of the periphery, you don't really have much of this hegemony. You are mostly ruling through force, through violence. And so, uh, before you can do anything about it, you need to, you need to uh, get rid of this violence. So, but, in the countries of the core, this, we're not talking about violence, we're talking about, again, this hegemony. hegemony. And Gramsci is saying, look, if you simply try to initiate a violent revolution in the countries of the core, this will not work. People in the street will not support you. They are afraid to lose their concessions. They are afraid to lose what little they have. So what you need to do is you need to engage in ideological struggle. You need to slowly and gradually, again, the slow boring of hard boards, you need to change the ideology. So again, both here, this war of position, war of position refers to well, in some sense, war of position refers to working on hegemony, on restructuring the, uh, uh, um, the social order, or the restructuring the social order um, through intellectuals. So, okay. I'm not sure if it's clear, but let's, let, 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 me, let me finish the paragraph, and then we'll see whether it's clear or not. So, war of position refers to the intellectual struggle, cultural struggle, struggle against hegemony. And uh, Gramsci, when he talks about this war of position, he talks about two different kinds of intellectuals. He's talking about traditional intellectuals and uh, uh, organic intellectuals. Traditional intellectuals and organic intellectuals. Intellectuals. So traditional intellectuals uh, in the countries of the core, but also in the countries of the periphery, countries of the periphery, intellectuals are not very important. You're mostly ruling for violence. But, but, I mean, they're also important, but less important. But in the countries of the poor, they're mo the most important. So the traditional intellectuals, these would be people like priests, school teachers, university professors, uh, media, newspapers, celebrities. So these would be the people who basically translate, um, um, retranslate, right? Propagate the, uh, hege the hegemony of the ruling class. These are, these, are, these are the people who help in the street in the newspapers, in the books, to present the interests of the ruling class as the interests of all. Or, I shouldn't say represent, to misrepresent. So these are the ideologues, if you want. And most of the time, they would not even necessarily understand what they're doing, right? They're puppets, puppets of the system. But the organic intellectuals, says Gramsci, these would be the intellectuals who understand what their interests are, and they are organically tied to a particular class. And so, like, mostly when Gramsci is talking about organic intellectuals, he's talking about organic intellectuals of the working class. But, in a certain weird sense, 
this always comes up. I'm asking myself, am I not an organic intellectual of the bourgeoisie? Could this not be the case? I don't know. That's an interesting question. I have to keep thinking about that. But there clearly are organic intellectuals of the bourgeoisie for, 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 for Gramsci. Anyway, um, so basically, basically, let me, again, have another pass at this system and let's see if this becomes clear. So basically, in, in, con in a country like Russia, you need a violent revolution. But then, through gradual and slow war of position, you reconstruct the ideological superstructure of society along the new lines. You educate the people. You educate them uh, in how to be you know, good democratic citizens. You create the civil society. You create the norms and the institutions which will be able to support your new communist utopia. This is what you do in, 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 in Russia. And basically, this is, this is, this is uh, uh, Gramsci's analysis. Okay, the first stage was successful, war of movement, excellent. The uh, um, Bolshevik movement has succeeded in taking power. Now, there's a huge task ahead of them. Will they be up to it? Short answer is no way. This is, this is, this is where the Russian Revolution completely and immediately failed. And in less than, basically, less than two decades, uh, well, less than a decade, actually, uh, um, resulted in, a, in a, what can only be characterized as a, as a successful counter-revolution. Um, uh, so, yeah, so this is, this is countries of the periphery. But countries of the core, countries of the core, you start with the war of position, which is to say that you don't go out into the streets, you don't protest, but you slowly and gradually, maybe in a way Weber will talk about this, or maybe more so in the way that uh, Heidegger will talk, or Foucault will talk about this. You slowly try to reshape the system from within, um, in the sense that, again, as an intellectual, you, are, you need to understand what the interests are, your interests are, and the interests of your society, if you want, and you try to spread the message. So this is, this is again, this is what we're talking about, superstructure. You need to organize top-down. You need to educate the people. And you are working against the grain of the, uh, of the economic system. So this is, this is, in some sense, is this Marxism without the proletariat? To some extent, yes. This is an intellectual-driven Marxism. The intellectuals need to educate the proletariat, need to explain to the proletariat their real interests. And only then you'll have the revolution. But notice, any organic intellectual is always, always faced with a choice. Do I want to go against existing society and educate the proletariat? Or do I want to be co-opted by the system and just simply preach from the pulpit? So Gramsci understands this very well. This is, this is, a, this is an uphill struggle. And Gramsci has this wonderful phrase. Um, optimism of the will, pessimism of the intellect. Optimism of the will, pessimism of the intellect. He is pessimistic. I mean, he will tell you about why this is not likely to succeed. I hope, Nikolai, you're taking notes, because this is leading Marxists explaining to us why communism is very hard or possibly impossible to achieve. It's very unfortunate that Alice is not with us today, because Antonio Gramsci is probably, uh, well, so there's, there's some competition among the Italian intellectuals, but he, he's, he's clearly one of the foremost ones. Okay, okay, I hope, I hope this is more or less clear, clear now, to, at least to some extent. And if you, if you, again, so we're talking, notice, I'm trying to talk about these things at the same time, international politics and national politics. If we try to translate this back into international politics, well, what about the perspectives of the war of movement? Well, sorry, again, United States, I remind you, spends on military, military spending is as much as the rest of the world combined. Is there any chance that a war of movement can be successful? You gotta be utopian. You 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 simply gotta be utopian. If something like the war of movement can succeed, you can always re-describe this as a violent terrorist insurgency that's violating human rights and just you know send in uh, drones or you know missiles. So 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 this this prospect becomes really really bleak, especially in the twenty first century. Is there some merit to this? Probably yes. Probably yes. So so this this is this is the project that remains. And the, the question is, will the organic intellectuals, will they be able to do their job, or will they be co-opted by, the, uh, by the system of traditional intellectuals? I hope, I hope that what I'm talking about makes more or less sense. And, and this is how you get from Gramsci to Habermas. Because Habermas wants to say that to the extent that you are an intellectual, that anybody who's an intellectual has to, at some point, recognize the system. And is there maybe a Kantian element in Habermas, maybe to some extent, this notion that, again, simply to the extent that you are an educated intellectual, you recognize certain rules and laws of rationality. And, and like, like to be co-opted by the traditional system, you would feel as a betrayal, as a betrayal of your ideals. That it, is, that it, is, it is impossible to be an intellectual uh, 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 and, and, not, and not feel a certain tension. That again, into, to be an intellectual, you need to have a certain level of self-respect and this, have this disinterested, mm, maybe, maybe, maybe I should write. So Habermas, talks about uh, um, 
Um, communicative rationality, compromise. So rationality, rules of rationality, more specifically what he talks, communicative rationality or communicative action. Communicative rationality, which is at bottom of this is this notion of pursuit of truth for the sake of truth. For the sake of, of truth. And, and basically, this is, this is his uh, uh, tentative solution. This is his hope. And basically, again, and, uh, Habermas is very adamant. Again, Habermas comes from a Marxist background. He's not a Marxist, okay? Habermas is not a Marxist. And he's actually, it's, 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 it's wrong to say that Habermas is a mem member of a Frankfurt school. I mean, technically speaking, yes, he's a student of Horkheimer and Adorno, but he has gone a very long way from those guys. But, but, but there, is a, there is this residual Marxist element in him, and then he says that again, that uh, today, the task of the intellectuals is to protect the sphere of civil society, of this communicative rationality, where, where people, again, uh, 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 talk to one another, you know, participate in what George Stuart Mill calls free and equal discussion, free and equal, to protect the spirit of free and equal discussion from the encroachments of ideological lies from the political sphere and ideological lies from the market sphere. So again, Habermas wants to protect uh, 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 protect the sphere of civil society against the encroachment of, again, if you want, market rationality and political rationality. Um, so, civil society versus the market on the one hand uh, and uh, politics on the, one, on, on the other. Uh, 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 uh. And basically he's saying market forces don't care about truth, they care about profit, so, so, so they are antithetical to truth, and uh, political process also doesn't care about truth, it cares about power. And, and so both of these forces are trying to erode uh, the base of civil society. But at the end of the day, again, uh, Habermas thinks that again, that, and it's, it's, it's a good question, uh, is, is this really a demand of reason? Is this really a demand of rationality? Well, maybe we'll have a chance to talk about this uh, uh, once more before the end of class. But like in one sentence, I would want to say the following thing, you see? And then John Stuart Mill kind of talks about this, you know, I, maybe at some point later, next year, maybe I should have a whole class just on John Stuart Mill. Because again, mm, you see, to the extent that you, as an organic intellectual, I, maybe, as an organic intellectual, give, give up my role and become a traditional intellectual and just you know, do this for pay, I lose my own access to the truth. Because you see, you can talk about Foucault all you want, all day. And I, I, who is Foucault in this picture? Well, actually, I would say that Foucault is a very careful Gramscian organic intellectual. And he is trying to, uh, 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 well, this is, this is uh, my view, my tentative view. I, I would want to see Foucault in, 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 in line with this project, who sees all the challenges, but very tentatively tries to work in this direction, in this direction, plays his part, if you want, in the war of position. Um, but still, there's always this uh, question, there's always this problem. How, how can we separate truth from persuasion? How can we separate truth from persuasion? If, an, if you find an argument plausible, is it because it just rhetorically convinces you, or is it because it's true? And uh, many philosophers, especially people like maybe Jacques Derrida, or to some extent Foucault, would want to blur this line, and would want to have a persuasion as a paradigm for all cases. But the trouble is, and Habermas says this, if you completely uh, uh, you know, erase this distinction between truth and persuasion, where are you left standing by yourself? Like again, if you need to make a certain decision, like if, you, if you're, if you're favorite cat, uh, is, if, your, if your beloved cat is sick and you need to take it to a, to a doctor, how do you know whom to trust? How do you know which medicine to take? Or, or you know, uh, uh, in your own life, your own approach, you, you, your own life choices, you know, what should I do, this or that? Should I have this surgery? Should I take this medicine? Should I, should I choose this career? Should I marry this person? Or, you know, should I buy this car? You are interested in truth. You yourself are interested in truth. And you could say, you could say, oh, oh, Habermas, but you are so naive, you know, Say hi to you know the ancient sophists, you know, to Callicles and Antiphon. What are you? So what are you talking about? It's truth for truth's sake. Everything is persuasion. People are horrible and selfish, and people lie and cheat, and you know this this whole. I know like everything. Well, this is wrong quote, but whatever. Everything is about sex, except for sex, which is about power. So human beings are base, horrible, selfish. And Habermas comes back and says, "Hmm, that's a very interesting statement. But when you say those words that humans are horrible, selfish, and lying, is this?" Are you, are you lying to me? Are you trying to achieve a certain goal? Or is this communicative rationality on your part and you're trying to warn me, actually? Again, like, at, at bottom, at bottom, of course, we know that skeptical and relativist arguments cannot be disproven. 
So it's not like Habermas has a knockdown argument against skepticism, solipsism, and relativism. That's not true. He doesn't have a knockdown argument. But he has a certain line of reasoning which makes, uh, uh, um, what's the right phrase, which, which makes it uncomfortable for a person to hold on to solipsistic, relativistic, uh, 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 skeptical positions. Like, if you yourself are a relativist and believe that everything is about power, is this belief itself, is it true or not? Mm. Let me let, 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 let me let me just leave it here. I mean, is this is this? Uh, why am I talking about this? Because because for modern, I don't I don't want to call him Habermas a Marxist, post Marxist. For modern post Marxists, this this is probably the last hope for humanity. This pursuit of truth for the sake of truth. And then of course, you know, people like Habermas or like or Pierre Bourdieu will talk about how in order to achieve this, you need to work for global equality, because again, you need to have competition in the intellectual sphere. Only then you can be. Not sure, but at least you can have some measure of confidence the things, uh, that things that, that you read and talk about are, to some extent, true and not completely false, right? So you need global access to this, again, free and equal discussion. But, you know, but at, on, but at, but at the same time, when I think of the, you know, <laughs> my worst case scenario, hive mind, hive mind, well, you could have free and equal discussion among the, uh, the, <laughs> the elite, among the philosopher kings, and everybody else is just uh, cattle to the slaughter. I don't know. These are these are pessimistic thoughts. I'm not sure. You know, let's think about this, or maybe let's talk about this some other day. Uh, uh, but that's 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 the picture. That's the picture. So it's like, what's the what's the what's the conclusion? The conclusion is we have this unequal system of international relations, which makes sure that the system will continue to be unequal in the national relations, because again, again, the concessions, concessions, and hegemony comes here because the countries of the core ex exploit the countries of the periphery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, international an inequality in the international relations creates a certain unequal regime in the national sphere. And this, if you look at the system, seems to, to sort of be in store for the predictable future. Like, for the predictable future, this unequal system is going to continue. I mean, countries of the core may change. You can have a whole world war, and some countries are out, other countries are in. Maybe uh, uh, America will go down as the, hege as the hegemon, and China will be the new hegemon. But, but the, 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 the core of the system, not the core, but the, the um, uh, structural logic of the system will persist into the future. Um, except, and, and the only thing that can save us, it seems, within the system, is what uh, uh, Gramsci calls the organic intellectual, or what the Habermas calls as you know, disinterested pursuit of truth for truth's sake, which is constantly in danger of being subverted. Basically, the intellectual is being bought off by, uh, uh, by the system, by the concessions within the system. So yeah, I mean, it's pessimistic. See, does, it, should, does this remind you of Plato? Or of uh, 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 Rousseau? Yeah, it's, uh, Plato, Plato, philosopher kings. Uh, politics uh, you know, is never going to be done properly until philosophers become kings or kings become philosophers. You see, see all this trick in the book. I mean, is Habermas saying something you with respect to Plato? <laughs> maybe not. Maybe not. Let me shift gears. And let me talk about something else. So I want to talk about uh, power. Um, and more, more specifically, sort of keeping this, uh, this picture in mind, to ask this question, because again, this, this is a course in philosophy and methodology of the social sciences, of the natural and the social sciences. So in terms of methodology of the social sciences, so what, what I'm giving you is supposed to be a scientific paradigm, but then the question is, empirically speaking, or, or, or like from the standpoint of scientific procedure, is it true or not? And why should we believe this? And why is it, why the hell is it that your economics textbooks don't, don't talk about any of this? And um, I want to introduce uh, uh, to a, a, you to a certain debate which is interesting in all sorts of ways. It's interesting for politics. It's also, those of you who are going to take political science, by the way, highly recommend. Uh, those of you who are going to take political science next semester, you will talk about it. You will have a whole class on this, on this issue. Uh, um, so we, we are talking about the so-called three-dimensional view of power. Three-dimensional view of power. This is the name of the topic. Um, now, more specifically, uh, uh, why am I talking about this and what is the significance? Um, so, three-dimensional view of power. Three. Um, so let's start with your economics textbooks. So, well, actually, no. Let's start one step before that. Uh, so outside of the Marxist tradition, there was this famous, very important American sociologist whose name was Charles Wright Mills. Do not confuse with John Stuart Mill. 
Okay, so Charles Wright Mills, C. W. Mills, and um, he wrote a sociological study in which he uh, uh, observed the it's called power elite or something like that, where he observed the functioning of the uh, political process in the United States of America, and this was this was actually I think in the fifties or something. So this was back in the day where America was much more democratic than it is now. Mm. And he has observed that, again, as a matter of empirical analysis, as a matter of empirical analysis, you can look at family connections, especially marriage, marriages between people, and you will find that people who belong to the military, uh, political, political in the sense of judicial, executive, and legislative elite, but also economic elite, and maybe cultural elite, that all of these people broadly speaking, belong to the same families. That there is, if you want, a revolving door uh, uh, between big business, big politics, and also big military. And um, again, this was supposed to be an empirical study. Take hi to Karl Popper. Uh, uh, empirically falsifiable study um, of what goes on. And you know, I think that the conclusions are interesting, and to a large extent, they still stand. But what was proposed against Charles Wright Mills, um, was this guy by the name of Robert Bell, and um, what he did, and, and, and this, this is later going, going to be known as the so-called one-dimensional view of power, one-dimensional view of power. And what he did specifically is he went to a particular town, I think it was New Haven, and he, realized, and he uh, observed how particular decisions were made uh, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the local government. And um, basically, he said, look, I can empirically prove that uh, Mills is wrong, that there is no elite in America, that actually in America what we have is pluralism, pluralism. And um, he you know, basically like, draws a pie chart and says, look, there's uh, uh, you know, 50 different decisions taken uh, in the course of the year, and if you look at what, e what, what interest groups within the city, different interest groups get their way uh, uh, you know, in different policy decisions. Like, for example, let's suppose you, um, there's, there's a demand in the community to have a new school open. Will this new school be open? Where exactly it will be located? How much money will be allocated? Says so you can observe the political process, and you can see that the American political process it, is pluralistic. It's pluralistic. And to some extent, this may be true. But then, this whole picture has been challenged uh, um, by... Um, one, two wonderful Hungarian uh, uh, political scientists with wonderful names, Beckrack and Barrett. So, Beckrack and Barrett. And again, I talk about this because it, first of all, I think it says something interesting and useful about politics on the one hand. But on the other hand, it deals with issues in this course. We're talking about philosophy and methodology of the natural and social sciences. Truth, truth, the status of truth, the status of empirical verification. It seems that if you believe Dow, empirically speaking, America is a democracy, or at least was a democracy, back, back in the time of Dow. Case closed. We can go home. Now, here come Becker and Barrett and say, no, that's not exactly right. And they introduce what's called the two-dimensional view of power. And the two-dimensional view of power is that they talk about the, 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 key, the key insight from what, they, what they're saying is that this focuses on decision making, decision making. But Beckhoff and Barrett introduced this term non decision making. What is non decision making? And again, can you make it empirically uh, uh, robust? Um, let's imagine a very simple example. Like you go door to door and you ask people, what is the attitude, to, let's say, to war in Vietnam, or what is their attitude towards copyright law? Ah, that one, that one, that's my favorite. So I think right now in the United States of America, the copyright, the copyright law is that 70 years after the person dies, their legal heirs are entitled to proceedings. Why is it 70 years? I mean, okay, we talk about uh, incentives, e economic incentives, that you need to have copyright law in order to incentivize the writers. 70 years after they die, again, if you go door to door and if you ask people, is this enough, or, or if you ask experts, 
is this, is this a reasonable amount in, in terms of uh, maximizing pr productivity in society? Why should it be 70 years and not, let's say, 20 years, or maybe one year, or maybe zero years, or maybe uh, the copyright should hold only, let's say, 20 years after you publish the book? And then regardless of whether you're alive or dead, it goes into the public domain. Wouldn't this be maybe more productive? Again, what, what, is just, what is the justification? What is this uh, natural rights argument? So, Beckham and Barrett would say that if you go door to door and you ask people, people would, would be in support of changing the legislation. But this question never comes up on the agenda. So, non decision making basically refers to control over the agenda. Control over the agenda. Certain issues never get raised, never get voted on. Control over the agenda. And notice, this, it's, it's, it's harder to measure, and their, their uh, uh, implication, what, what, they're, what, they're, what they're trying to suggest, is that there are certain mechanisms within the political process that prevent these issues from being raised. For example, politicians, in order to be elected, usually in the United States of America, take huge donations from private corporations, and these corporations are not interested in that kind of stuff. It's harder to observe, it's harder to quantify, but still, you can do this. You can go door to door, you can ask, and it's still empirical. Still, Karl Popper is glad. Karl Popper is satisfied. You, you, are, you are doing this empirically. empirically. Uh, uh, and and this, this immediately already introduces a certain uh, um, you know, very grim element to this picture. And so, Dao, on, at the end of the day, wants to say, yeah, okay, all this elite, they belong to the same classes, but it doesn't matter, because the political process is equal. And these guys are saying, no, these elites belong, belong to the same families. These are the same people. And actually, control, by controlling the agenda, they um, stack the deck in their favor. Uh, they introduce uh, you know, certain inequality into the system, which makes it deeply undemocratic. So here comes um, the last point. Well, actually, there's going to be a, a postscript into this. But you, the, 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 third, the third part of the story is Stephen Luke's. Stephen Luke's. Some of you, I think, are writing about Luke's. I think it's at least one person. And Stephen Luke introduces what he calls the, the, the three-dimensional view of power. And this one is hardest to empirically uh, um, operationalize, to empirically, you know, to make sense of empirically. But Luke also thinks it's, 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 it's clear. So let's imagine, and he has, he has particular examples. He talks about some uh, uh, town of miners, Shaktiore, right, somewhere in Latin America. Where, where it's not a question of people uh, uh, not being represented, I mean, like uh, people losing in, the, um, you know, in this decision-making process. And it's not even the question of control of the, over the agenda, because again, it was important for Beckwith and Barrett to satisfy Popper, you need to be able to go door to door and ask people, what do you want? And to show the discrepancy between what people want and what actually happens in politics. Uh, Luke's talks about uh, well, he has a technical term, and technical terms I actually forget, but he talks about real interests. And if you want, ideologically misrepresented interests. Uh, well, yeah, it's something like Foucault, but it's also something like Gramsci, it's also something like Marx. This is the old issue of ideology. And I want to say that on a certain level, this should not be problematic at all. Because we know, as an empirical matter of fact, that this happens. This happens to everybody. That you, know, you thought something was good for you, but actually it was a mistake. And it's actually not good for you. And, and what you are doing, what, let's say, what you are voting for, is against your uh, uh, core interest. Again, the non-problematic examples are usually children. So children may want something, they think it's something that they want, but actually their real interest lies elsewhere. Now, immediately, this is a big problem, and uh, uh, Luke understands this is a big problem, because who will decide what are your real interests? Uh -huh. Like, you yourself may not be in a position to judge. And of course, again, uh, uh, Luke is, is a Marxist. So, uh, so, not a Marxist, not a Marxist, not a Marxist. Luke is the only Marxist on this side of the, on this side of the board. And Luke is saying, look, these people, these uh, um, um, miners uh, uh, of South America, they don't have the free time to try to analyze their real interest. They don't have the education to understand that. They do not have the time and the education to look at the political process, to see which candidates uh, um, uh, support them. 
if there are no candidates who support them, they do not have the time and education to put forward a candidate of their own. So it makes a certain amount of sense. Now, of course, again, this one is much more problematic because here and here we're talking about fairly strictly observable things. Here, at the end of the day, it's not clear if there is a strict and clear procedure to determine what, what real interests are. But, but you know, and so, so this is farther, as far as possible, removed from Popper. But still, I think that, again, Popper would have to at least agree that this is in principle possible, that there is this, that there is this discrepancy. And then the key question is, how do you know what the real interests are? And here is where we go back to this side of the board. And we have to ask, with, uh, with Habermas, could it be that there are people who are trying to pursue truth for the sake of truth? Could it be with Gramsci that there are organic intellectuals who understand the interests better? And could it be that sort of th there's you know, some uh, uh, um, possibility of movement in that, in that direction? By the way, as I'm talking about this, I'm pretty sure that I could get some uncontroversial examples where everybody in this room would agree that, that these things are, you know, uh, um, misaligned. Again, Luke's example of this uh, mining village is, pr is probably, you know, if most of you looked at that, you say, yeah, these people are fooled, okay? They're, they're taken advantage of by shrewd politicians. I mean, does this never happen? Right? And, and so and maybe it's hard to understand what human real interests are, you know, get some Foucault here in this room, but it, it's, it could be pretty clear that people are, 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 are certainly being taken advantage of against their, against their best judgment, not being able to. Uh, um, uh, to judge for themselves. So, and, and this is in some sense, this is how, so again, if you go back to this picture, to tie this side of the board to this side of the board, this is how the political process is organized in the countries of the core. In the countries of the periphery, you don't need this. In the countries of the periphery, you can just have violence. Well, you can have violence at minimal level of uh, ideology. Because, you know, uh, low-skill, uneducated workers don't take much to be persuaded. You know, have one official TV channel with some religious figure preaching, preaching to them, it's, it's going to be fine. Uh, but, but in the countries of the core, in the countries of the core, yeah, this is, this is where it gets tricky. In the countries of the core, this is where it gets tricky. It's, uh, the, the, the political process on the surface looks legitimate and pluralistic, but actually there's this sinister control of, over the agenda. But actually, even, even below that, there are mechanisms in society that actively prevent people from realizing their best interests. And uh, uh, this is what keeps this, uh, 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 this situation in check. Because again, I remind you that for Marx, the only real revolutionary uh, element in this whole system, you know, the, the bets, the bets uh, of, of, of Marx are placed on this part. These are the guys who need, to, who need to realize their historical role. And these are the people who need to organize the proletariat in the countries of the periphery. And together, together, they will overthrow the system. But it takes a lot of time and, and effort. And uh, uh, basically, again, the key question then becomes, why do these people not realize their uh, uh, genuine long-term interests? And that's the reason. Again, especially, you know, what are we talking about this? Ideological misrepresentation of economic interests. It's uh, Katz and Rosen, Economics 101. The kind of thing that you study here. This is, this is what I'm talking about. Let's, 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 let's not beat around the bush. Um, but of course, if you want, you can continue the story. You can continue you know, into the depths of Moria or somewhere, you know, into the uh, depths of the ocean and meet the old ones with Cthulhu and the rest of the planet. You, we are, of course, talking about Michel Foucault. And Michel Foucault he could be seen, I think, very productively. And Maybe, hopefully, this is even uploaded to the information system. There's a wonderful article about Michel Foucault as the fourth face of power. So we are not talking about... So these, these are like uh, decision-making, it's uh, clear, it's open, it's perceived. This one is this hidden agenda, mobilization bias. Here, again, we have real interest and ideological interest. But Michel Foucault would talk about, you know, like the limits of rationality. Basically, the limits of this, pursuit of truth for truth's sake, limits of rationality. And if here we're talking about direct and visible power, here we're, having, we're talking about power behind the curtains, here we're talking about ideological power, the power to fool people, here we're talking about impersonal power. The, here is the, if you want, the power that the uh, 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 anonymous discourses uh, exercise over us. And to this, there seems to be no good answer. Stephen Luke's uh, in, in sort of uh, having a dialogue with Michel Foucault in his head, 
I don't think it was a real dialogue, talks about how it's, it's dangerous to talk about fourth place of power because if you focus too much on this, you, uh, uh, you run the risk of forgetting about all of this. Like again, like if you say, oh, everything is power and everything is ideology, you, this, this, can be very con this can have very conservative uh, um, uh, effects and this can you know, effectively protect the status quo and this can block people from realizing this system. Uh, um, from realizing that this system is, a, is, a, is, a, is at work. And so, I mean, at the end of the day, because again, remember, Foucault himself was very much committed to <laughs> actual human liberty and equality. And um, for, for good reasons or for bad reasons, it doesn't, doesn't really matter for our purposes. But, uh, uh, I mean, ultimately, I would say that Foucault uh, is probably somewhere here, organic intellectual, and maybe Karimarsian, even to some extent. But at the same time, Foucault as a Nietzschean and as a Heideggerian understands this. And he's looking into the abyss. And this is what prevents him from, from operating on this level. But so it's like Foucault is kind of like a combination of the two. He's like trying to be an organic intellectual even though he sees the limits of this uh, uh, rationality. Uh, um, uh, interesting deep tension between conservatism and revolution uh, um, in Foucault himself. Well, he does talk about, the, the, he does talk about the, uh, um, the individual project. So in terms of his individual project, I mean, what he himself did with his life, and especially later in life when he talks about uh, hermeneutics of the subject, he is, I think, very clearly operating on this level. When he talks about how the task of criticism is to unlearn all the uh, maladaptive things that the society has injected into your head. Mm. Mm. In this individual project of self-creation, construction of oneself as a work of art, seems to be operating on this level. But there's always this uh, Cthulian, Lovecraftian shadow. Uh, uh, you know, limits of rationality. So, Luke talks about these three. Begins with uh, uh, Robert Downs, says that um, mm -hmm. Dow focuses on behavior, uh, observable behavior. He's talking about, he's focusing on decision making. Uh, decision making on key issues. And he's talking about observable conflict. And he is talking about subjective interests as seen through policy preferences revealed by political participation. So when he's talking about preference, he, when he's talking about interests, he assumes that the interests are what actually people vote for. So Beckett and Barrett talk about decision making and non decision making. Uh, and they also talk about, again, these potential issues. So covert conflict. Covert conflict. So here, the conflict is observable, it's overt. Here it's covert, it's uh, uh, non-observable, if you want. Um, because we're not just talking about actual issues which are debated in the political sphere, but we're also talking about potential issues. Like, for example, the copyright law. Potential issues. And uh, um, so here we're talking about interests as seen by people actually participating. Here we're talking about interests as, um, for example, again, you go door to door and you actually ask people what their interests are. And um, uh, Luke characterizes his own position, talks about decision making and control over the political agenda, not necessarily through decisions. So again, issues and potential issues. And he also introduces this term latent conflict. So again, so observable conflict is what, what, what actually gets debated on television. Covert conflict is what could be debated on television in the sense that people have these preferences. Again, if you, if you ask people like, their, their opinion on copyright law, you could have a debate then and there if you, if you only let people speak. But latent conflict is issues where people don't know, they haven't thought about it, they don't understand that there is a conflict. Mm -hmm. so, it is, so it is, it is you know, if you want, unconscious. People, and again, again, again. The, like, this is very important. Because epistemologically speaking, why, why Karl Popper should be happy in the end? Because um, Robert Dahl says, sorry, Stephen Luke says that at the end of the day, if you take people and you, you give them a chance to participate politically, you give them a chance to educate themselves, they would, at the end of the day, agree that, the, the, that their real interests were misrepresented. This is, what, this is kind of important. This is what ultimately puts the lid on all this discussion. Because again, like, child, tries to do something, and the parents say, don't. Like, ah, drink bleach. Child, a child wants to drink bleach. And the parents say, no, it's a bad idea. It's a conflict with your real interest and, you know, ideologically misrepresented interest by, you know, beautiful advertisement on the, on the label. Um, and the, 
why is this, why is this uh, conflict of real interest and misrepresented? Because when the child grows up, the child can look back and say, yes, I should not have drunk bleach. Thank you very much, parents, for not letting me. Uh -huh. So at the end of the day, you yourself should be able, maybe not now, but at least later, at least potentially, should be able to judge. This is not, this is Orwellian, uh, uh, you know, uh, peace is war, war, war is peace and slavery is freedom. Uh -huh. That's 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 the uh, that's the issue, and of course, again, like uh, if you, the the key issue is how do you want to bring that about? Do you want to sort of have this uh, dictatorial party that just tells everybody uh, uh, what to think? That's not Marxism, because again, you see, already already in uh, in Gramsci, you have this notion of gradual war of position where you educate the people, and or even if you, even if you win the war of movement, you still need to fight the war of position. In a sense that people need to be uh, uh, educated on this stage. And if, if they're not educated on this stage, then your revolution ends in counter-revolution and you just create a different kind of hegemony. So actually, you know, in some sense, if you point to party leaders in uh, China and Russia and other quote-unquote socialist experiments, if you try to point to them as uh, examples which, which disprove Luke's and others, it's, it's, it's actually, you know, it's, um, what's the right phrase? Marxists are actually in the best possible position to explain why and how these authoritarian regimes work. Oh, by the way, let me, let me talk about fascism. I need you one sentence. So this is, this is Marxist take on fascism. And, one, and of course, there are many different Marxists, and they would have a slightly different take, obviously. But this is one way, one particular approach. <clears throat> by appealing to nationalist sentiment, fascists facilitate a temporary alliance between <laughs> sectors of industry, between industry and agriculture, and between large-scale modern industry and traditional petty bourgeois producers, whose mass support allows economic elites to extend their influence over the state and to discipline organized labor through the abolition of collective labor rights and the reduction of the law to an instrument of state terror. Mm. I don't have a lot of, a lot of space on the board, but let me write this somewhere. Uh, such a beautiful picture. I don't want to erase anything, but I have to. Uh, Let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see if this is going to be more space. So we're talking about nationalism. Okay, it's unfortunate, but this has to go. We're talking about nationalism. Control of the state by the bourgeoisie, so bourgeoisie controls the state. Um, then the uh, disciplining organized labor through abolition of collective labor rights and reduction of law to instrument of state terror. So again, so abolition of collective labor rights, basically of trade unions. So abolition of trade unions. Or, or controlling of the trade unions, and state terror. And, and all of this in the attempt to uh, discipline organized labor. Yeah. Discipline labor. Discipline and punish, almost. Um, first of all, let's tie this to the picture. This is what we're talking about. How the country, countries in the periphery characteristically do this. Now, uh, you could say, well, but Germany, after the, after the First World War, is not the country of the periphery. Yes, but hard hit by economic depression. Because again, again, a uh, uh, short version. And you see, Marxism has a lot of, uh, it's not the explanation of everything, but it's always a good start. Uh, it's a lot of run for its money, right? Uh, why did, why did uh, Germany become fascist? Simple, simple explanation. Uh, Great Depression, United States of America. Collapse of the markets. Then you have, uh, 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 you know, the burden of uh, reparations after the First World War. The economy collapses, and uh, Hitler comes to power. It's, an, oh, it's an obviously an oversimplification. The situation is more complex than that. But as a bare bones analysis, that's a good start. Um, and again, I keep talking about Marx. You know, forget about communism. Is communism even possible in the system? I spent the last two lectures talking about how communism is highly unlikely for these reasons, right? But as an as an analysis of capitalism goes a long way, and analysis, uh, through analysis of capitalism, analysis of all sorts of um, uh, processes in the modern, in the modern world. Um, so this is, again, what characteristically countries of, of the periphery do. And now, look at this picture. Well, again, and what, 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 is, what is the ultimate purpose of fascism? 
is to uh, mobilize labor, is to organize labor within, within like, the, the ultimate purpose of fascism is economic. And now look at this picture and tell me that on this definition, Stalin's Russia is not fascist. And the answer is, it is. I mean, on steric economic analysis, if you if you try to say, oh, communism uh, cannot you know be realized because uh, uh, Russia and China, fight. yeah, but Russia and China were not communists; they were fascist. Complete opposite of communism. Yeah, they used Marxist ideology as an ideology, but what they actually did is again by misrepresenting the interests of the uh, party leaders as the interest of the whole. They again, are we talking about abolition of trade unions? Yes. Because the trade unions that existed in Nazi Germany, but also in the Soviet Russia and in Communist China, we're not talking, we're not talking about real trade unions where people unionize. No, unions as something that, that is imposed from above, as an, as a, as an, uh, uh, what's right, the cog in this machine of state terror. Like, it's not, it's not free uh, workers unionizing because they want to. No, it is the state requiring any, everybody to belong to a labor union, which is not really a union at all, but again, a, a disciplinary repressive organization. And again, this issue of state terror, especially this issue of state terror, repressions, concentration camps, yes, that's exactly what we're talking about. And that's exactly the opposite of what Marx is talking about. And Marx is going to say, oh, yeah, but the, uh, uh, the, the country, you know, the wonderful, um, you know, Iceland and Denmark and Norway and the United States don't have concentration camps. Yes, they don't have concentration camps because they occupy a different position in the latter. But it's the same system. It is the same system that gives you concentration camps on the one hand and quote unquote free elections, like these kinds of free elections, on the other hand, capitalist parliamentarism. I give you both, and in some important sense, Wallerstein would say that one is the flips, is the necessary flip side of the other. And this is again, this is a big question. Uh, can you have countries like Norway and Iceland without countries like uh, China, India, and Bangladesh, and Africa with a reserve army of unemployed? And uh, again, don't necessarily have to agree with the conclusion, but uh, Wallerstein's conclusion is no, no, no. So again, uh, uh, the way that the economy is structured, the bourgeoisie of Iceland is able to share concessions with the uh, bourgeoisified proletariat of Iceland because they exploit uh, um, the proletariat abroad. Because, you know, Iceland's proletariat does not, leave in, does not live in Iceland. <sighs> Russia is a wonderful example always. When you talk about these things, Russia, Russia is such a strange country. Does Russia have an economy? You, know, you find a, ch a, a chest of gold, and you slowly dole it out. Does that, does that count as economy? I'm not actually sure. Uh, but um, uh, you know, in terms of this picture, if you look at you know all the wonderful things we have in this room, how much of this is actually produced in China? Does Russian proletariat live in Russia? I mean, Russia is not the richest and the most prosperous country of the world. But even in Russia, can you say that Russian proletariat lives in Russia? And to a large extent, the, an the answer is no, no. Again, all of these wonderful things I have, even this probably, is, is made in China, I wonder. Just for fun. Oh, wow, wow. Made in Germany. <laughs> this is impressive. I did not see that coming. Okay. I stand corrected. Exception to the Okay, oh, wow. Excellent, I have such a lot of time. Minus 10 seconds. Questions? Problems? Is this fun? Is this interesting? I hope it is. I hope this, is, I, I hope this is, gives you a, a, an interesting other side of the issue, talking about economics uh, locally and also globally, you know, as opposed to the kinds of things you study in your economics classes. Okay, people, unfortunately, we're out of time. I hope that this was fun. If you have any questions, I would be more than glad to answer. Otherwise, again, thank you so very much, and I'll see you in the seminars.